Welcome to uh, the introductory lecture uh, for geographic information technology. What we're going to do in this lecture is look at the, the, the term geographic information technology and try and break it down a little bit, look at what the contents of this course will be from a, a, a more, shall we say, philosophical point of view, a theoretical point of view, rather than the mechanical details of clicking on buttons and performing certain actions. We will also look at the, the technology behind this uh, in a reasonably detailed level in order to understand what it is that happens with information, uh, what becomes information, what becomes of information. So let's move on. Let's start going through the, the, the slides now and look at this lecture to see if we can get a better understanding for what these terms mean. So if we start by looking at the term information here, uh, we can ask several questions um, that are connected to information and this what we're going to look at here is information more directly connected to, to GIS and, and Git um, in order to uh, understand it in that sense but of course information is very broadly applied otherwise but this is from our geographical uh, point of view. So we can ask the questions such as what. Um, we have the, the, um, something growing perhaps in a field, what is growing there, um, what is being collected, uh, what is there. This is a, a very basic fundamental question. We can also ask how much of something is there. Now this how much may be, uh, how, how much is growing in a field by, in terms of weight or by volume or by area. It might be a volume of water collected, rainfall for example, precipitation. Uh, or how much is also actually elevation. So when we're looking at a, a digital elevation model, that is telling us how much elevation there is in a particular area. That is also a, a, a valid question, something that is addressed frequently in GIS and, G, and GIT. We can also look at who owns things. For example, a plot of land or a house, um, services, who is owning it and who uses it as well. They're not necessarily the same thing. Uh, the relationship between uh, ownership and, and usage uh, is often um, a primary uh, task when using GIS, depending on, on what you're working with. Um, but this, this is an important relationship and we need to remember that they're not the same thing. Uh, but we also need to consider how something is used. This again may be what crop is growing in a field or um, connecting bus routes or, or travel along through a network uh, when performing network analysis, for example. These are all questions that we might want to ask. This is all information about things, about the world perhaps, or about us in the world. And then we have the term geographic. So what, what do we mean by this? Well, the obvious uh, answer there, the perhaps naive uh, answer is where. Um, we, we ask the question of where something is in the world, or within a country or near us. But more importantly, uh, in geography as a subject, we're asking the question why. Not just where, but why, and why is really the, the, uh, the important point here. It's, it's not separable from the where in, in most cases, and in fact the connection between the where and the why is um, essentially the, the subject of geography. Uh, these connections, is it, is it the where that creates the why, or is it the why that creates the where, or uh, does it go both ways? This is um, what we really would consider to be geographic in the geographic information systems. So to exemplify what we mean here, this is a, a very crude uh, um, topography here. We have a, sort of a plain and then a, a plain here and then a hill and then we go into a valley and a mountain. And we're asking the question where, and we're going to put things, things, whatever these things are, are going to be placed in our landscape. And we see here the weather blowing in from the right of the screen. Uh, and then eventually we end up with a distribution of water and, and forest and then uh, maybe a, a, a low growth landscape further on. So how has this occurred? This is, um, there's a connection between the different places. The mass of air is blowing in from the right here. We have something called orographic uplift, pushing the, the mass of air upwards. And as air rises, as you probably are aware, as it rises, it becomes cooler. This is um, just a law of physics uh, that is uh, at work here. The, the adiabatic lapse rate. Uh, means that as the, the air lifts and expands, it cools. And as it cools, um, what we get is uh, an increase in relative humidity. The amount of uh, water in the, in the air has remained the same, but its ability to hold onto it has decreased. 
therefore we increase the chances of precipitation, rain, snowfall. Uh, and so if we have a precipitation at higher uh, elevation here, higher altitudes, we the, the rain falls out. And then as it sinks back down again, as it passes over the mountain, it warms up once more and it's now drier because as it warms, it can hold on to more air, to more uh, moisture, uh, which means that it warms, uh, which means it becomes drier, which means we get less precipitation. But it also warms at a higher rate. This is just a, a, the, the adiabatic lapse rate for uh, drier air is steeper than for uh, humid air. So we get uh, a, a warming of the air as it falls down on the other side of the mountain here. And then the air continues. Uh, and there's precipitation and it dries out and it can't acquire more moisture from anywhere to, uh, to, in, to allow rainfall further uh, on downstream, so to speak. In certain cases, this is what actually happens. That, uh, if we have lots of forest, we can have evaporation here and the moisture returns to the air and we can have uh, increased precipitation further inland. This is a, a, a very relevant uh, effect, something that um, we're quite worried about uh, now in um, say the Amazon uh, with deforestation, meaning that uh, moisture is not available to be evaporated from the forest to then be transported farther inland. Uh, and so we'll get not just a drying out of the coast, but drying up further inland uh, in areas which are actually without the, the coastal forest dry. This is not, this is just an, exam uh, an example of um, what we mean by the where and the why and the connection between them. Uh, but this actually applies to many different systems, many different ways of looking at the world. So we can move on. And this is always connected to a theory. Uh, if we're talking about being geographers, we have some idea of theory or scientists in general. So our theories here in terms of geography, uh, we can look at processes. Uh, here I've exemplified it with such things as erosion um, and flow. Flow was uh, actually what we were looking at uh, in the previous slide where we had a flow of air passing over and up and then down again. Uh, also connected to things like erosion and tectonics. Tectonics is the movement of uh, the, the plates on the Earth's surface pushing up mountains, for example. Uh, so we create the, the topography that then altered the flow that, uh, that then meant that we have precipitation in some places and not in others. But we could be looking at things like uh, economies of scale, for example, if we're talking about human geography or economics, how we move around in the world, how things are flow between different areas, uh, concentrations allowing uh, these economies of scale at certain places. For example, it could be other things as well, depending on what we're looking at, which processes, uh, which, which systems we're, we're examining. But we might also connect our theories to certain types of models. And that we have models, this, Typically, we can talk about uh, the, the conceptual model, where we have this idea, what I described previously, uh, with the air mass flowing over the mountains, we can say that's a, a conceptual model. Uh, we have some air, we conceptually uh, can think of it as cooling as it rises, uh, and that increases our precipitation. We can describe it in words, these concepts. Um, if we collect data, we go out into, out into the world, and we measure things and we collect lots of data, data points. And we put this data into uh, onto a spreadsheet or into a computer in some way uh, and we begin analysing it. And we can see a, say a, perhaps a correlation or some, something, some relationship between uh, parts of our data where um, when A is large, B is small, or when B is large, A is small. Um, and this, with this we can uh, find in our statistical data, there seems to be this correlation there. Uh, we don't perhaps know why, but it is that way. We can see that in the data. If we then look at this data and we, we try to think about why it might be this way, we can examine the laws of physics and look at those, and we can imagine a conceptual model that might explain these things. And if we're happy with that conceptualization and the laws that we've pulled into our model to, or into our conceptual model to explain the statistics, we might take the relationship in the statistical model and turn it into a mathematical relationship. A is equal to one over B, say, for example. Whatever, wh whatever that might be, we have this model explaining it. Um, and that's our mathematical model. Our mathematical model is connected to a conceptual model and some laws describing things. So we've gone from the collection of data in the field, a statistical model, we found a, a mathematical relationship within the statistics and then turned that into a mathematical model 
simplifying, we remove the statistics, we, don't, we no longer need the data points uh, to, to justify it. We have our conceptual model based on the laws of, on, on natural laws. So that's, that becomes our mathematical model. It's not always correct, maybe we may, we may misapply it, uh, of course, but uh, uh, it's there as a mathematical model for us to use. But we can also connect our theory to, to methods, and this is quite often where um, mistakes are made. Uh, this is the, the part, when, it, when, when we are talking about uh, GIS and GIT, looking at these things, this is where your skills come in. This is what something that you uh, need to learn. Data collection and data processing, these things influence what we can see, the interpretations we make. Uh, we collect data in a particular way. Um, the, the thing that we collect is not the thing we're interested in. We are collecting data about some aspect of the thing we want to explain. And we may not even be able to collect uh, data on the, on the thing itself or any particular aspect of it. We may collect so-called proxy data. So it's not even the thing that we're interested in. It's not even uh, some aspect of it. We're not even able to measure, um, say if I were to uh, measure what I was interested in, in finding out how tall you are. Uh, I can't even measure your height. I can't even walk up to you and hold a ruler and, uh, and measure how tall you are, I have to look at your shadow and then find out where the sun is uh, and work out the angle uh, of the sun and then see how long the, the length of your shadow is to say, oh, okay, then you must be this tall. For example, that, that may be what I, what the, the only method I have of collecting information on how tall you are. So our data collection affects what we can actually uh, um, uh, say about the, the thing that we're actually interested in, but then also how we process that data. How, what happens when we put it into the computer? Um, how does that affect uh, our ability to, to um, examine and work with the data? What the processing we do? Do we influence things in any particular way? Our statistical analysis, what is it that we do there that influences how we see the data? What, what, what inferences can we make or are we making because we have used a particular method or because our data looks a particular way when put into a computer? And these influence our interpretations. And our interpretations also influence our data collection. And everything works back and forth. All of these things we need to, to consider. We need to think about them. And as I've said, this part here is easy to forget for many people. And this is something that we want to work with uh, on this course, to try and think about what it is you're doing um, that may influence the things that you see on the screen or the, or, or the, the results that you think that you have. Um, we can also examine our theories, um, why we work the way we work and what it is we're looking at, um, using the, 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 something called ontology. Now, this is a word we've borrowed, in from, uh, borrowed from uh, philosophy and misuse somewhat, but let's not worry about that. Um, so that basically we're asking the question of, um, of what there is in the world. Uh, and why it's there. And the why is perhaps connected to um, um, what we were talking about in the previous slide, uh, potentially, but it also co goes back uh, to uh, previous slides uh, to, to that. What is there in the world? What can we examine? What things do we think actually exist, uh, given who we are? So if we're a human geographer, uh, and there we, we're looking at a, a patch of coniferous forest, and we're asking the question, well, why is this here? Why do we have a patch of coniferous forest in this particular place? And we might look at the utility of that forest and where the people are so that they're not doing anything else with the land, and where, or, or they, they want to use it for this particular thing. So we have some people around and they've built some infrastructure around it and then maybe they want to harvest the, the, the forest, pick out trees from it to, to, to make wood or firewood. Um, and how many people are there around there? loading, uh, uh, taking out from this forest, or contributing to it, perhaps. Um, but there's also the question of ownership. Um, how is this forest divided between different owners? Uh, is, does that influence uh, why we have coniferous forest rather than something else there? Or are there zoning laws, quite simply? Have we said, we can't do anything else with this, we want, we want a nice uh, nature area here, so the forest is allowed to grow. So that's looking at it from a, a human geography point of view. Uh, the coniferous forest is there perhaps because of these different factors. But as a physical geographer, when we're looking at this patch of forest, 
why is it there? Well, it's there because it can grow there. There's the, the climate is, is, is right for it and the soils are right. So we, we look at the, the, the amount of rainfall. Is there enough or too much rainfall for, for this or for something else? Is the, the temperature regime, does it get cold enough in the winter to kill off pests? Or is it warm enough in the summer for it to grow vigorously enough? Uh, and these are connected to elevation, perhaps. Uh, the soil type as well. Uh, is the drainage, uh, the right type of drainage? Is it, uh, does it drain too easily, too freely? Or, or, does it, uh, or does it hold on to too much moisture so it becomes uh, too, too humid in the soil for, the, for our trees, depending on what type of trees we have? So we look at these questions uh, and look at these qualities. And we, uh, it's still the same patch of forest. We're still looking at exactly the same thing. But we're saying it's there because of these things. Uh, but as, if you're an ecologist, why is the coniferous forest there? Uh, you, you can say, well, nothing ever exists in a steady state. Uh, there's always change. If any natural system that's allowed to change will change. It will uh, proceed through uh, different stages. There's succession, if you like. Um, but this is also influenced by what is there to, to come in and bring about this change. What other things exist in, around it? Uh, what species are there to begin with? Uh, which will also influence the direction in which um, uh, an area will take. Uh, which species are there to begin with tells us how nutrients will build up and the, and the diversity within the system uh, and so on and so forth. And then that will influence what happens down the, uh, down the line. But also how well connected it is to other areas. Can new species uh, come into this area? Do they have the ability to, to, to invade, uh, to colonise this area? which will also change the, 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 the progress of this area. But at the moment, it's a coniferous forest because of things that have happened in the past. Uh, the species, that the particular species of trees that are growing there have at some point managed to invade. They've come in and now competed everything else, and now they're growing successfully there. But we might look at this from an economic point of view as well, where um, from, uh, as an economist, we just say, well, this patch of land is uh, optimally used for coniferous forest. Uh, the distance to our to our market we can uh, is it's far enough away from the market to not be useful for anything else, but it's not too far away so that it's expensive to get the the wood into where it's needed. Uh, it's also um, able to produce enough to be relevant for us. We don't want low productivity areas because then our effort to get there to, to harvest and then bring it to market is it's just not worth it if there's not enough production. And this but this is also connected to connectivity, how well connected, how easily can we get to this area to, to, to turn it into a productive coniferous forest. So all of this is, these are different ways that we can look at the same patch of forest uh, and examine why it should exist where it exists, um, instead of just saying it's there.